so much for that abrupt fade out. <laughs> I was uh, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll go ahead and fade this out. And that didn't quite work as we thought it did. So we're going to start off this morning or this evening with a technical glitch. Just want to welcome you all to, uh, to .NET BC here for our April 2022 meeting. Uh, I'm Sean Colleen, the uh, one of the co-organizers of .NET DC. And we are joined tonight by Kevin Jones of GitHub, uh, who you see here next to me. So I want to just say hello to everybody out there and, uh, and hope you're having a wonderful evening or a wonderful day whatever time of day it might be for you around the world. And uh, speaking of wherever you are in the world, for those of us who are joining, I know we're getting kicked off right, right at the top of the hour here. So we'll give a few minutes for folks to file in. But you know, as you're coming in, definitely want to hear a little bit about where you're joining us from. So feel free to, to drop that in the chat and say hello and, and say where you're coming from. Uh, Kevin, how are you doing this evening? Not bad. Thanks for having me. Uh, how are you? I'm I'm doing great. I have been. Uh, it's been a, it's been a long couple of days. Uh, we're you know got a toddler at home, and and some sleep days are easier than others. Uh, it's the story a story that many parents know, uh, but always always an adventure. Um, lately, we have been having a. Uh, a great, uh, a great time where he has, a, he's a very big vocabulary, uh, but the last few weeks he's been using that vocabulary to say that he would like to be a, apart from me or away from me in many ways, um, which oh, is, no. which is fine. I'm not taking it personally, but the amount of ways that he is expressing it is truly uh, astounding to me. And so it's one of those things to see, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, a great, great thing to see there. Hey, I see Tim. Tim is in the chat. Tim, former colleague of mine. Hey, Tim, how you doing? Uh, great, great to see you there. Happy to have you. Uh, happy to have you with us. Hope you'll stick around for the presentation. I think it's going to be a, a great one. But always nice to see a, a friendly face there in the chat. Um, and Tim, uh, just testing the chat uh, the effects there. Tim says, "Go, Sean." So certainly, I don't ever mind seeing that in the chat. So uh, great, great to see you there, Tim. So. Uh, also, um, as we as we have folks start filtering in, figure we'll do a we'll do some icebreakers, say hello. And so, if you've got anything on your mind, or you've got anything that you want to discuss, or just say hello, or any announcements you'd like to make, feel free to go ahead and and drop those in the chat, uh, and we we'll go from there. And I figured I'll also do some some icebreaker polls, which you can see um, here on the uh, in the chat as well. But we'll. Uh, the, the address there is pollev.com slash Sean K431. And uh, we can see that there. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and we'll kick off an activity. And I'm just curious. Uh, we'll start off with just a, a pretty standard one. I'd love to know. I asked the chat, but we might as well uh, activate it. I'd love to know where in the world you are uh, viewing uh, this presentation from. So I've activated that poll at, uh, at Sean K431. So feel free to, to uh, respond to that. And we'll see. We'll see where folks are joining us from. I guess I'll click the present button to do it full screen. There we go. And Tim, I see, I saw Tim's comment in the chat. Welcome to being a dad. Thanks, Tim. It's an adventure every day. That's great. We've got we've got at least one fo one person joining us from outside the U.S., which is awesome. So really happy to to have you here with us. That's really great. And I always wonder um, how far the reach of .NET DC goes. So it's always lovely to see uh, folks joining us from other parts of the country or outside of the um, outside of the the continental U.S. There, really, really nice to see. All right. And I know Kevin, you are um, you're in the you're in we're in the some the same area uh, these days. But you know, where, are are you originally from from the area here in in uh, on the East Coast, or, or where, where did you originate from? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, depends. Um, I moved around a lot throughout my life. Um, most of it in the Midwest, um, in the Chicago and, you know, the Cornfields area. And then later in life, uh, uh, somewhere, somewhere along the East Coast, whether that's, you know, Charleston, South Carolina. And, but I've been in Northern Virginia since 2006. Uh, somewhere made a couple moves around here you know like yourself I have a kid now um, had to move a little bit further out you know to find a appropriately uh, affordable house um, but still in the northern Virginia area since so yes for those for those of us joining us from the Seattle area looks there may be one person I promise you that we have a, a comparably crazy housing market um, so, well, perhaps not, not quite as, not quite as bad, but certainly up there in terms of the volatility of that market. So, uh, under, uh, with you there, 
Kevin, for sure. And, and you've been, uh, what got you into developing? Um, or into technology in general, I should say. I was something I was good at. It's pretty interesting. And I think for a, quite a long time, I've always done it, uh, a twist on that with uh, security and cryptography. Um, so that's kind of, you know, my professional background. How I got into it is um, I was pretty good at it and people were willing to give me money for it. Um, those are kind of like the two important things, I think, for, uh, for a career. Um, uh, interestingly, though, I did go to uh, school to be a math teacher, not in software engineering. Oh, really interesting. I didn't know that you had a background in education. That's, that's, that's really cool. Did you, did you, so you said you wanted to teach math specifically, were you geared Mm -hmm. towards like, were you geared towards a specific level that you were kind of thinking about teaching originally? It was a secondary education. So that was going to be anywhere from middle school to high school. I did teach a class of middle schoolers for a year. Now you said, what was that experience like? Um, It was actually pretty good. Um, I still keep this as a, you know, thing in my back pocket of something I might do later in my life if I decide I can't stand computers anymore. Um, uh, or maybe, uh, you know, as I, you know, get closer to retirement age, but I'm still looking for something to keep me busy. Maybe I'll uh, consider the teaching uh, aspect again. It was, uh, you know, enjoyable. It was pretty rewarding. It's, you know, it's got its own frustrations. You know, their seventh graders are at an interesting time in their life. Um, so, uh but overall, I, I actually really enjoyed it. That's got to be neat. I, I think that we, when we interact with adults so often, I think those of us who aren't in the teaching profession forget what a different world it can be to be simultaneously interacting with 20 plus students who may have a very different mindset or like you said, are at a very different time in their life. So that's a, a very, I think, a great background to have in terms of it probably helps with facilitation. It probably helps with understanding different perspectives on things or, or you know, different communication styles. So I, I bet you there's probably a lot that you're able to carry forward into your work today. Yeah, I would probably agree. Um, uh, just patience, ability to do mentoring, you know, those kinds of things are all things that, you know, whatever your profession is are good things to do. There's just a good emphasis on that in teaching. Absolutely. Do you find yourself being in cryptography? Do you find yourself? Um, do you find yourself interacting with machines more than people, or or GitHub is it really an equal mix of, of people? I've always wondered how much you know. You have this kind of image of folks who are um, doing uh, security cryptography as like they're very deep in the machines, and I. But I imagine GitHub GitHub being a very collaborative place. Like, what is that mix like of of deep? diving into those things versus working with with humans i mean the majority of my role is working with humans when you're in an architecture kind of role um uh, i mean really what my team is for is making sure other teams are able to build awesome stuff and do it securely i mean that's kind of like just a one one sentence mission statement of you know how can we help you and you know what does that mean are we Uh, Can we look at some code for you? Are there things that, you know, paved paths that are missing that we can help you build or build for you? Um, But, you know, it all boils down to people. You know, I do get into the weeds of writing, you know, some code every now and then. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, the people aspect of things is where I tend to be more involved. That makes a lot of sense. And I think also it, it almost sounds like you're putting the, the sec part in DevSecOps in terms of making sure that that's a collaborative people oriented thing and that security is happening naturally. Does that, does that tend to be, I mean, of course that in the federal contracting space, that's, that's all the buzz, right? Is the the term DevSecOps and I've, I've got my own opinions on it, but is that sort of how that plays out uh, in your current role in terms of the, you know, the the smaller feedback loops and being a part of that natural process and enabling things Um, or, or what's your sort of take on, on DevSecOps? And by the way, I should apologize first because I didn't tell Kevin I was going to be asking these questions and I'm just kind of rolling with it and you're <laughs> being okay. a really good sport about it and I appreciate it. I promise we won't be 100 questions before we start. No, um, you know, I think, you know, what we have at GitHub is kind of like an organic version of DevSecOps. You know, it you know wasn't necessarily anything that, you know, somebody looked at DevSecOps and said like, oh, that's a cool buzzword that we need to do. But 
Um, what it really kind of came comes down to is, is, you know, GitHub's big, it keeps growing, keeps getting bigger. We need to scale, you know, the ability for other teams to build more things. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that you're building the right thing, that you're, you know, uh, that we can help you build the right thing and that you don't come to us, you know, two weeks before shipping and we go like, whoa, hold on. That's, that's not a good idea. That's like a bad case scenario. Like we don't want to tell you, sure. no. we want to look at something and go like, this is awesome. You know, we, we want you to feel successful in building and shipping what it is you're set out to do. How can we help? Um, so that, that's kind of like the, you know, approach, you know, that, you know, myself and our team would take is, you know, uh, every, every idea starts from, you know, a good intention and how do we make sure the good idea and the good intentions align and what we end up building is and shipping is something that, you know, is positive for, you know, our users. Nice. Absolutely. I, I, I love those teams of enablement and it makes, I'm, I can't, I'm not surprised, of course, coming from, from GitHub and hearing those teams of, of enablement and how do we say yes and how do we make things happen in a, in a smart way naturally. Um, that, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Do you, I, I did not ask you ahead of time, so if you don't, it's totally okay. Do you have any fun stories so far about your time at GitHub or, or your, your work uh, there at the moment? No, I haven't taken down prod yet. Um, okay. So you're not even that. That may not even qualify me as a uh, fully indoctrinated GitHub developer right now. Um, uh, but you know, truth be told, I don't you know ship a whole lot of code. You know, I'm again, I'm working on the people parts of things. Um, uh, not a whole lot of fun stories either. Again, because COVID, you know, I haven't actually met any of my teammates in person yet. Every time that we've had, you know, our you know, a couple thoughts on, you know, maybe we can do a face to face someday, you know, that's kind of always, uh, everyone's a little bit like, well, you know, travel restrictions and those kinds of things. Um, but I really do enjoy the work there. Nice. Excellent. And for those of you, I see we've got a couple more viewers now that are showing up, at least on my monitors. Just want to say, hey, everybody, welcome uh, to to the talk tonight. We've got a poll up here. Uh, we you know, Kevin was curious prior from the audience just to understand, hey, have you used Stack Alloc before? By the way, how do you pronounce that, Kevin? Stack Alec. Stack Alec. Okay, wasn't sure if it was. You know, there's some newfangled way. I, I have to say, I've I've heard many new newer pronunciations working in tech that do not make sense to me at first. So I'm happy at least that Stack Alec is pronounced as I would expect it to be. Maybe um, we're both pronouncing it wrong, but um, uh, that's that's how I'm going to be referring to it. I'm sure that someone in the comments will tell us if we are. That's great. Um, so, okay, well then, so for those of you who are joining us, we do have a poll up on, on whether you used Stack Alloc before. Uh, and so it looks like so far we, we got a decent amount of folks saying at least they've used it or have heard of it, about 20% of folks. It's not a huge sample size, but it looks like about 20% of folks are saying uh, they have very little uh, firsthand knowledge of Stack Alloc. Um, and so, oh. Or I've encouraged more people to respond, which is great. Um, so definitely feel free to, to look at that poll, take a, uh, a view on that. And we'll give that a couple more minutes. We'll leave that up as we hang out here. And then in about a couple minutes, what I'll probably do is I'll put up the presentation. But in the meantime, uh, we're happy that you're here. If you've got announcements or you're hiring or there's something that you'd like this group to know, uh, feel free to put that up in the comments. And we'll we'll go ahead and, and you know, go ahead and feature that and, and respond to that if you've got any general questions. If, if it's a relevant to Kevin's topic, we'll, we'll bunch them up and save them for, for the presentation. But if you've got anything in general that you'd like the group to know or, or be aware of, feel free to drop that in the comments uh, or in the chat for, for the event, and we'll be happy to, to put that up on the screen. And definitely interested in getting your thoughts on, on this poll and whether you used Stack Alloc before. So I know, uh, so Kevin, you, as part of doing, you know, the, being involved in the work, I know you've done several things on the cutting edge of, of .NET and some of the pull requests that you've been working on and, and had submitted uh, around uh, different aspects. I, I want to ask you, are there any favorite things that you have about the up and coming .NET 7 or anything that's your favorite about .NET 6, which is with us now that, that, uh, yeah. that you want to riff on or, or that you're particularly enjoying? Um, so I do do quite a bit of work on .NET itself. Um, you can find me pretty active on the .NET runtime repository. Um, uh, as a fair warning, though, I am not, I'm kind of on the .NET. I'm not really, like, I don't have any inside knowledge of, you know, 
uh, things that they're building or anything like that. What what I see and what I know about is all on GitHub. Um, so I don't have any inside secrets. Um, no secret things, handshakes for you. No. Um, uh, I think the most privilege I have is, is I can DM people on teams and be really annoying. Um, but uh, that requires me to open teams. So I don't do that that often. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, .NET 7 is, I, I think, going to be a pretty awesome release. There's a lot of refinements of things, you know, that were new in .NET 6 that I think 7 is going to make better. You know, you've got, you know, uh, Maui, you've got, you know, more platform support um, that's, you know, coming along. You know, uh, there's going to be tons of stuff. And I don't want to steal their thunder. Um, and also, I don't know a whole lot in there. I can bore everyone to tears and tell you all the awesome stuff that we're doing, you know, with security APIs that I think, you know, the joke is like five people on the planet will care about. Um, but uh, uh, it's every release is better than the last one. Excellent. Well, you know, with that, I think I see our, I don't see our poll getting any more responses. So I figure what I'll do at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and close that out. And then we'll jump over to uh, the, the .NET uh, DC GitHub repository here. Um, and what I want to uh, show you here is that .NET DC has a GitHub repository at github.com slash .NET DC. So uh, we're on Meetup and Twitter and GitHub at the handle .NET DC. And our repository here is at github.com slash .NET DC. And what you can do, uh, what you can view here is uh, one of the repositories I think it's most important to pay attention to if you're interested in getting involved is the this open governance repository. What we try to do is we have an open issue for every meeting. One of the things you can see here is that most of our meetings still don't have speakers assigned. And that's because it's just, me underwater with other things trying to find speakers. So if you're interested in speaking or there's something that you'd like to talk about, definitely feel free to raise your hand. I'd love to work it out and get you on there for one of these dates that we have scheduled. Um, if you need some flexibility on a date, happy to do that as well. Um, just, just go ahead and, and let me know. Um, one of the other features that we have about this open governance repository is that we have uh, discussions. If there's something that you want to see, a topic idea or a request that you have, feel free to add it or upload it. If you'd like to volunteer to be a speaker, feel free to add yourself in the speaker volunteers section. If you'd like to uh, show and tell something that you've done recently uh, that, that you're proud of, we're always happy to see that. And of course, I'll put some, some announcements there as well. But definitely, if you're interested in a certain topic or speaking, we're really uh, trying to drive based on your feedback as an audience. So head there and, and check it out and give us some feedback and, and add a comment and let us know, let us know what you think. Uh, and so from there, we'll jump into, uh, I, I don't have many slides uh, for the evening, but we'll, we'll jump into that before we kick it over to Kevin. Uh, and so uh, one of the things uh, I want to mention at the top of the hour, of course, is that uh, we are sponsored by Excella. Um, Excella is uh, where, where I am employed currently as, as one of the uh, principal technical fellows for modern software delivery. Um, Excella is, uh, is located in the Arlington area. We are uh, a, a consulting firm that specializes in modern software delivery, organizational transformation, um, you know, AI and advanced analytics. And so if you're interested in any of those things uh, or you think that we might be able to noodle on a fun problem together, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I've got the hookups. We can have a fun conversation. Um, also, I should mention, because I asked in the chat if anybody's got announcements, if you're hiring, feel free to put that in the chat as well. And just to put that out there, totally hiring right now. So if you're interested in, uh, in in finding out what we're all about or seeing what's going on, feel free to to put that in the chat or feel free to send me a message. Uh, you'll note that Kevin and I on our banners here both have our Twitter handles up. So feel free to reach out to, to either of us at, in, in those places. Uh, we also have some great sponsorship from Manning. So if you're interested in a Manning publication, we thank them for, for their support as well. What they offer is they offer 30% off to all of our members. Uh, so you're going to use the code UG367 at checkout for, for their user group discount. That gets you 30% off. Um, tried it the other day. It still works. So definitely feel free to make use of that if you're going to make a, a purchase with Manning. Um, sort of your way of telling them that we sent you. 
the .NET Foundation has is one of the nicest uh, one of the nice things the .NET Foundation is doing is offering us to have uh, this live streamed as well or, or through their meetup, uh, which is the .NET Virtual Meetup Community. Um, so the .NET Foundation, if you are interested in getting involved, uh, there are several ways. I know that several of the .NET Foundation committees are looking for for members. Uh, their .NET Foundation is looking for ways to improve the experience of maintainers and other members of its community. So feel free to reach out there. That's the website. Uh, and you can also reach out to me if you'd like some uh, some additional thoughts on that. I'm currently a member of the working group for maintainers and, and maintainer support. Uh, and so I'm happy to provide any insight I can have there. Though I should note, I've been pretty delinquent. I think I've missed the last few meetings. And so I got to gotta go own up to that here live on stream. So yell at me and tell me to get back to those .NET Foundation meetings. So speaking of the .NET Foundation virtual user group, um, you can find that at meetup.com slash .NET virtual user group. Uh, and so that's where, uh, we're able to uh, you know, find all of these events from all over the country. Uh, it's a phenomenal aggregator source for a lot of great .NET content. So if you like .NET video content, you're interested, there's something going on multiple times a week. It's definitely worth, worth checking out if you've uh, got some time and you're, and you're interested in this sort of format. So lastly, as I mentioned, uh, typically this is where we wish we were in person. We wish we could have you raise your hand. We wish you could have you uh, pop on a, a Zoom meeting and unmute yourself and tell us about something. But if you've got any coming events or you're hiring or there's anything else you want us to know, do feel free to drop it in the comments in the chat and we'll be sure to, to feature that as, as we go. So don't worry uh, about that. And remember, uh, we do have the meetup discussions and the online group there at github.com slash, <laughs> it says dc.net github.com slash .net DC. All right, so that brings us to our speaker tonight. Uh, Kevin Jones is here with us. Thank you for uh, enduring my 100 questions prior to the, the uh, event kicking off there, Kevin. But uh, Kevin is a man of mystery, and he is short on bios. So what Kevin has provided is that Kevin does security at GitHub. Uh, and you can find him online at his handle on both Gitter, GitHub and Twitter, at VCS Jones. Uh, and Kevin, as you may have gathered from the title of this meetup, is going to be talking about uh, Stack Alloc with us tonight. And I'm really happy to have him here, because I think that as professionals, it behooves us to go a little bit deeper into our tools and our frameworks. And uh, this is a great opportunity opportunity to understand a little bit more about some of the lower level stuff that makes things tick um, without getting into trouble uh, with ourselves. So I think uh, Kevin's, uh, the abstract was, was going to help us avoid the sharp edges, so to speak. And so we're really happy to have him here tonight. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kevin and we'll, we'll bring your slides up and, and feel free to take it away, Kevin. Okay. Sounds good. All right. There we go. I'm just going to move forward, back. Okay, cool. Um, I know what I'm doing here. All right. Um, so, hi, thank you for joining me. Um, I am uh, happy to be here, and we are going to talk about Stack Alec. And if you follow me on Twitter or uh, such, uh, you've probably seen me rant about it before. Um, and I was asked, you know, maybe you can turn this into a talk, and I did. So, here we are. Um, before we get started, I do have a couple of things uh, I want to go over. Um, I think all of the slides are still going to be provided. Um, elsewhere, but if you miss them, or if you want to see some of my other presentations, they're also on GitHub at github.com slash BCS Jones slash presentations. Um, uh, to be explicit about my uh, presentations, it is um, Creative Commons of uh, uh, 4.0 share alike. So you are absolutely free to take these slides, steal them, represent them, modify them. Um, the only restriction is don't turn them in the money. So don't publish them, you know, whatever. Um, the other caveat that I wanted to mention is we are going to see a lot of scary code that isn't obviously scary. Um, so if you're going to, you know, take some of this code, I would be very advised and say um, a lot of this code, you should not copy and paste and put it in there, but into production workloads. But if you want to, you know, do that to noodle around or, you know, try and reproduce some of this, you know, what I've been talking about on your own, absolutely feel free to do that. Um, likewise, the code also falls under uh, Apache uh, 2.0 license uh, sharing. So if there are code snippets in here that you find useful, feel free to make use out of them. Okay, so that out of the way, um, let's go ahead and uh, uh, talk about Stack Alec. And I thought the best way to start off with, you know, Stack Alec is what exactly is it? Um, 
Uh, it's, you know, in the .NET world, it is a C-sharp keyword that allocates memory on the stack. And we are going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's actually been there since C-sharp 1.0, um, but it's only very recently gotten a lot of attention. Uh, one of the things that's happened quite a bit since uh, the .NET Core days, um, when we pivoted from .NET Framework to .NET Core, has been a strong emphasis on performance. Um, and that's good. Performance is great. Performance means we can scale more. It means we can use less resources. It means being more energy efficient. It means, you know, a whole lot of things. And uh, one of the key ways that you can uh, sometimes, you know, get a little bit more performance out of uh, things is using Stack Alec. Um, uh, with the exception that it does come with some sharp edges, which we are all going to talk about. Um, so, next slide. Um, what exactly is the stack? So, let's look at this little uh, sample code right here. We have something called, you know, some method, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Um, where exactly are those numbers in memory? Um, and to be fair, as .NET developers, we don't care. I don't care about memory. That's one of the things .NET wasn't supposed to, you know, have me concerned about was, I don't care if it's in a register. I don't care if it's on the heap. I don't care if it's on the stack. I don't, you know, I just want to write my code and have it work. But if you do want to get into some of those, you know, low level optimizations, you do kind of need to start paying attention to some of those things. So um, the stack in a nutshell is think of it as a chunk of memory that every thread on your computer has, and it is a fixed size. Um, and it is something that uh, your operating system and the CPU will cooperate on with each other. So it is actually, you know, a hardware concept uh, in your computer. It is not just, you know, something that, you know, Windows and, you know, Mac all just, you know, invented on their own. It's something that, uh, you know, the respective chip manufacturers and the operating systems and drivers and compilers all need to agree on how the stack works. Um, so the stack is, you know, thinking of as, as a, you know, fixed memory structure, you can put anything you want in the stack. You can put, you know, data in it, you can put numbers in it. So, you know, looking at my previous example here, we see this number five, there's a decent chance that number five is going to be on the stack. Um, one, two, three, and four might be in registers. Um, that again, depends on something called a calling convention, which yeah, most of us don't really care about that one either. Um, but at some point, your compiler, your .NET runtimes, you know, everything eventually ends up putting data in the stack somewhere. Um, and the CPU keeps track of this through your stack pointer register. So let's look at an example um, using assembly because everybody programs in assembly these days. We have a snippet of C code that just has a car message called hi with an exclamation point and we print it. So, you know, last example on uh, the uh, Intel processors, x86, 64-bit. It's in a register called RSP. Um, uh, it's SP stands for stack pointer. R is a prefix to mean it's 64-bit. If it was a 32-bit processor, it would be ESP. I don't know why. Um, Intel. Um, so what do we do? Well, we have high which is, you know, three characters. So we see that RSP, we subtract 24 from RSP. We are saying, give me reserve 24 bytes on the stack for me. We put high on the stack by just taking the word high, which our C compiler conveniently packed into a single integer. So it only has to do one move. Um, Shoves that onto the stack. Oh, don't know why the slide changed. Okay, there we go. Um, we do a little bit of other things to uh, fix up our registers. We call 
printf. And then when our function is done, we add 24 back to our stack and that's it. So um, this is a pretty convenient way for a compiler to, you know, allocate memory and uh, do something in that memory space. And then when the method is done or function, uh, depending on, you know, what you want to call it, it just has to say, great, add back everything we use on the stack. So we reserve 24. We, if we needed 30, we'd say subtract 30, you know, whatever. Um, otherwise, you know, it's just as simple as adding and subtracting from this stack pointer. Um, one thing to point out with the stack is that it is a shared resource between different functions. So if your first function, function A, starts off with, you know, 100 kilobytes of stack space and then uses 10 of it and then calls function B, function B only has 90. So when function, and let's say B uses another 10, then you have C, C only has 80. Um, and we have probably heard of the venerable website, stackoverflow.com. What is a stack overflow? A stack overflow is literally what happens when you run out of stack space. Um, so it is a resource that is not uh, extremely abundant and you have to be very careful with how you use it, which we will go into in a bit. Um, now I've said a couple of times that the memory is freed and I'm using free in quotes here because it's really just an add when the function returns what happens if in my example here I have function b and I want to give this stack data that function b has made back to a well you can't do that actually that's one of the limitations of the stack the stack is not useful and I'm generalizing a little bit here but as far as .NET developers are concerned, and you know most traditional uh, other languages, you cannot take data, put it in the stack, and then give it to the method that called you with it, because it's been freed. As soon as B's done, you know, as soon as the uh, return keyword appears, you have to give that memory back to the stack. It's not an option. You have to put that add back on your stack pointer. Um, and the compilers will admit that for you because, again, we're not doing this um, and we're talking about low level assembly. But you cannot take stack data and, uh, you know, give it back to the method that called you. You can only go the other way since it's shared down but not out. Uh, you can have function A put something on the stack or use the stack and say, OK, function B, I'm going to call you. Uh, here's some stack data. And as long as function A is what reserved that stack data and said, I want to put, you know, three bytes on the stack and you tell function B, okay, now go write those three bytes to function uh, to, the, to that place on the stack, that's okay. I know this is sounding a little obtuse, so we'll, we'll get there, uh, I promise. Um, but the nice thing about the stack is it is a very lightweight mechanism which requires very little memory management. It's literally just adding and subtracting for the most part. Um, and if there's one thing that CPUs are good at and fast at is just adding and subtracting numbers. Um, so, and the nice thing is we didn't have to call free or anything with this stack data because again, when the method you know is done, it's just free. Uh, it's a you know very nice mechanism. You can't leak memory doing this way um, in a traditional way. So um, when the stack is a suitable thing to use, a lot of native developers will use it. Um, but as .NET developers, we have not really ever needed to use the stack or care about it or uh, used it all that much. Uh, let's compare this with the heap. The heap is another place that you can put memory. This is where you know, you might actually start, you know, seeing some recognizable C things like malloc and free. Um, this is, again, a cooperation with the operating system. Um, the nice thing about the heap is that you uh, 
don't ever have to free the memory. It is available to your whole, whole program, regardless of when a method returns or does not return. Um, uh, and uh, it's a very large available resource compared to the stack. The downside uh, uh, to this is uh, it is kind of in the sense with a C developer, something you're going to do a lot of manual memory management. You know, if I forgot to call free in this code right here, that would be a memory leak because, you know, it's C code. There's no garbage collector. Um, likewise, you can have the opposite problem where you call free on something, but then start writing to it and using it anywhere anyway. That's called a use after free. And those are often security vulnerabilities. Um, so, it's a lot more flexible, flexible, but it has the, you know, its own, you know, rough edges of it's difficult to um, uh, manage the heap uh, traditionally. But again, as .NET developers, we don't really care about that. Um, so the heap, you know, it requires manual memory management, the stack, that's kind of not something you have to do. That's a cooperation between, you know, your processor, your OS, and your compiler. Um, your stack size is small. You can't make it any bigger. How much, how much, uh, how small I'm talking about, we'll talk about later because that depends. Um, the heap, on the other hand, can be enormous. It's really only limited based on how much resources your computer has. You can say, hey, heap, give me two gigabytes of memory as long as your computer can support giving you two gigabytes of memory, either because that much memory is available or because you have a swap file or a page file that, you know, whatever. Um, and the other nice thing about the heap is let's you run malloc and you're out of memory. Malloc is just going to return nil or null um, saying you can recover from that. However you want, you could say like, okay, maybe I only need half. Um, or maybe I'm gonna throw up a message box that says like, hey, you're out of memory. Or, you know, maybe you'll just, you know, thread sleep and try again later. The stack on the other hand, when you've exhausted all of your stack space, your program is going to crash. Okay, so this is a .NET user group. Um, and it has only taken us 42 minutes to talk about something related to .NET, but I promise we're here. Um, the .NET has historically always preferred doing things on the heap. You know, all of those things, you know, when we say string message equals high, when we say new array, whatever, all of those things are on the heap. Um, what .NET takes away from this is having to do that free part and knowing when to call free. That's what the garbage collector does. Um, the .NET does also use the stack sometimes. Um, you know, like when we have an int num equals zero, well, that's on, that's possibly on the stack. Again, it's all kind of, you know, fuzzy on uh, where things are sometimes when the compiler is making decisions for you. But um, that is one of the differences between a struct and a class is structs like integers or shorts or anything else that is a uh, numeric type or a user-defined struct. Those are probably going to be on the stack unless you box them. Hey, so Kevin, quick, quick question for yeah. those in the group who may not be familiar with the term boxing and what it means. Can you riff on that for, for a second? Sure. So boxing is basically the idea of, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> um, when you need to take a value type or a struct and you want to put it in the heap, the .NET runtime makes this very transparent for you. Um, a good example of that is when you cast an integer to an object, um, when you, uh, uh, or, you know, you say, uh, let's say the word, I don't, I don't think y'all can see my, where my mouse is pointing, but I'm pointing at that int num. Let's say that int was the word object. Well, objects we know are classes, but 
you can put integers and objects, that's a box. Um, and that's really what the runtime is, is doing is it's taking this value type and it's shoving it into a box that the .NET runtime knows is boxed and it can be unboxed later into a value type. The difference is when you box, it's more like it's, it, that enables it to be on the heap. Um, uh, the uh, C-sharp language doesn't necessarily always make it obvious when boxing is happening and isn't happening. Uh, an example of where it's not obvious where it's happening is let's say you have a field on a uh, class and that field is of type integer. Well, fields are always on the heap. And so that's in a sense boxed. Um, or if you have a method that takes an object and you're passing it an integer, well, it's going to box it before converting it to an object. This enables the .NET runtime to uh, uh, treat a something that is a value type as a reference type. The downside to boxing things is that means it's now on the heap. Um, and in .NET, the downside to things being on the heap is that means it has work for your garbage collector to do. Um, that is really one of the, you know, uh, the primary performance concerns with, you know, stack versus heap. Like, why do I even care about the stack? Okay, fine. The garbage, it's, you know, I don't care. What, why does it matter to me? The, from a performance perspective, the primary benefit of doing things on the stack is it doesn't need to be allocated and freed. And even though we don't see that happening in our code, we don't say, you know, malloc and free in C sharp. What we do mean, what that does mean though, is, is the garbage collector has to keep track of that object itself. That's called pressure on the garbage collector. Um, and that's what we're trying to avoid when we use the stack is it is something the garbage collector doesn't have to care about. This needs a uh, variables message and data. Um, they are going to get garbage collected. This int num equals zero, assuming it's just a variable inside of a method that does not need to be garbage collected. The garbage collector never sees it because it's on the stack. Um, so, so far I've, you know, kind of, you know, said like, great, the .NET's using stack, you know, where, where, where does stack alloc fit in this? So uh, uh, to quickly summarize, so we know that variables on them, uh, that is a struct is probably on the stack unless it's been boxed. Um, the one thing that is not on the uh, stack is arrays. Arrays are a very common data structure um, in, I think, any programming language or, you know, any runtime. You know, whether you're using an array, the arrays are useful in .NET for holding collections of things. Uh, if you're using, you know, lists or dictionaries, those are just wrappers on top of arrays where, you know, the dot, where those classes, you know, just make working with arrays easier by, you know, uh, having a big array that's filled with a buffer um, and you can add things to the array just by, you know, using one of the available slots. And if the array gets full, then it makes a new array and it copies everything from the old array into the new array to resize it. But at the end of the day, if you have some sort of collection of stuff in .NET and it's an array, um, then it's probably backed by an array. And this is where a lot of garbage collection uh, pressure comes from. Uh, so enter stack alloc. Uh, okay. So uh, let's look at stack alloc from, you know, like I promised, it's been there since .NET 1.0. I don't mean .NET Core 1.0. I mean .NET 1.0, like, you know, Visual Studio 2002, not even the 1.1 that everyone talks about. Like it was an OG .NET feature. Um, and it wasn't particularly popular until, you know, and you could use it, of course, but there were uh, really two things going against it. The first is, is um, you had to wrap it in this thing called an unsafe region. Um, because what stack alloc did in .NET uh, 1.0 and, you know, uh, still does to this day, if you want it to, uh, it returns an unsafe pointer, uh, which 
you know, uh, we're not going to talk about too much with pointers in .NET, but it basically just works kind of like a C pointer. It's just pointing to some data. You don't know how long the array is. The .NET runtime can't, uh, you know, do any things like array bounds checking. So if I said, hey, get me the 65th item in data, it's going to try, you know, uh, worst case, you get garbage. Uh, best case, you crash the program. I say crashing the program is best case because uh, for me, worst case is wrong data. Uh, crashes are always good. Crashes means you know something is wrong versus silently working, you know, wrong is, you know, that may mean you're uh, using corrupt data or you're reading data that isn't even yours. Um, so it required using unsafe code. Um, and maybe that's not really a big barrier to people. Maybe some people are like, you know what, fine. I'm comfortable using pointers and stuff like that. The other big barrier was you really couldn't do much with pointers in .NET. Um, you know, if you wanted to use, uh, if you had a collection of data, like you wanted to hash it or encrypt it or write it to a file or anything like that, they didn't take byte pointers. Um, you could, some things did, like system.txt. I think some particular overloads of stream might have. But for the most part, pointers, you know, had very specific use cases because, you know, if you wanted to do something, you know, with a pointer in .NET, you really couldn't. Like, let's say you have a pointer to a character uh, in .NET. Transforming, you know, a string from uppercase to lowercase using just pointers there really wasn't an API to do that. Um, so it was this very niche feature that, you know, enabled some very high performance scenarios, but the rest of .NET didn't really just play along with it. Um, and since then, a couple of things have changed. The first one is the introduction of span. And we're gonna have to talk about span because it does uh, have an important role with stack alloc. Um, the first thing is, is you will notice that I don't have this chunk of this little, you know, bracket called unsafe around it anymore. So the unsafe part is gone. Some people think that was a mistake. Some people think it should have required unsafe still anyways. Um, and we'll see why later. That's the whole sharp edges thing. Um, so unsafe went away, but the real thing is, is, you know, since, you know, .NET Core 2 and .NET 5, .NET 6, .NET 7, tons of new APIs have been added that work with span. So while there weren't a lot of APIs for dealing with pointers, all of the uh, APIs uh, that where it made sense to have spans, uh, have spans, like you can hash a span, you can encrypt a span, you can make a span of characters go from uppercase to lowercase. You can do index of looking for characters with spans. There's you know, really, you know, any times that we want a span, there's an API in .NET for it now. And if there isn't, then please open a bug report and maybe you can try to write one. Um, so uh, why do we uh, care about the stack in .NET? Well, we know that allocating on the stack does not do anything with the garbage collector. Um, and why does that matter though? What's wrong with things being collected by the garbage collector? Um, uh, the garbage collector, you know, it takes time to do something like that. If you're having a method that, you know, puts a lot of things on the heap in a loop and it's just spewing a lot of garbage, well, your program has to keep up with that garbage or it's going to run out of memory. So the garbage collector needs to keep up with, you know, the, how much pressure is on the garbage collector. It needs to free those things up. Uh, uh, otherwise, you run out of memory. If it doesn't, you know, and then you run out of memory. If it does, then that means the garbage collector is this thread that's running in the background of your program. Um, and if it's very busy, well, this thread is now using resources. Um, so you're going to have, you know, this thread that's just consuming CPU time. There's also some times where the garbage collector literally has to stop your whole program. Um, it's called a GC pause. Those can happen at any time in your program. The garbage collector literally tells every single thread um, uh, that uh, your program should just pause. Uh, 
And while your program is paused, the garbage collector, you know, needs to really quickly figure out, you know, what can I free up? You know, it might do something called heat compaction to avoid memory fragmentation. Uh, so putting pressure on the garbage collector, you know, really may, you know, hurt perf. Even if your code executes fast um, still, it means your program is spending CPU cycles doing something else. Um, or in the worst case, it means your, your program is spending time doing nothing because the garbage collector needs to, needed to tell everything, just say, stop, I got to organize everything. Uh, so where Stack Alec really shines and where not putting pressure on the garbage collection is in something called a hot path, where you have code that is executing uh, very frequently and uh, either because it's in a loop or because it's, you know, business critical or something like that. Uh, you know, think about how many times, you know, we uh, take a string and convert it from uppercase to lowercase or lowercase to uppercase uh, before putting it into a database uh, or, you know, how often, you know, we need to hash something. Um, I'm a security guy. I, I need to hash stuff all the time. That's probably not true for a lot of people. Um, uh, but, you know, there are those needs for those kinds of things. All right, so let's look at an example. Um, we've got a method here. This, uh, its job is to say, give me a number, and I'm going to give you a random string, a hex string. So it says, you know, uh, I want to get a random string that is 32 characters in length. So what does it do? Well, it creates a string. And it just says, get me a random number between zero and the length of up to the length of our character set. It fill and it just tacks on that character at the end of the string. And then it returns a string. Does this work? Yes, it does. Um, but it's allocated 576 bytes while we did this. Uh, and one reason for this is because, well, we know strings in .NET are immutable. Once you create a string in .NET, you can't change it. Um, not using, you know, regular code anyways. If you take a string and you, uh, you know, combine two strings to make a third string, that is another string. So we start off with an empty string and then we add another character to it. So we've made two strings and then three strings and then four strings and then five strings and six strings. And eventually we've made, you know, 32 strings if our length was 32, which works it's just inefficient um now how often are you calling get random string maybe that doesn't matter maybe this is something you know that's used you know quite a bit for something that is a small function that does something in a loop this actually uses quite a bit of memory and you can see in our uh, output here this is benchmark.net uh by the way of this uh table at the bottom uh Benchmark.net is a very, very cool tool for looking at, you know, doing micro benchmarks where you can take something like get random string and say, you know, how much time is this taking? You know, uh, what, uh, how much memory is it taking? So we can see here that it used, you know, 1.4 microseconds, which, you know, again, microseconds, you know, that's a thousandth of a second. And we've allocated a little more than, you know, half a kilobyte. Let's improve this. Well, we do know that arrays are mutable. You can't change their length, but you can change what's in an array. So rather than make 32 strings, what we can do is we can say, create a car buffer of length, fill that array up with a random character. And so far, all we're doing is, is we're just taking a random character and we are putting it into the car array. We are not uh, uh, allocating every time we put something in there. And then finally, we convert that car array into a string once the car array has been finally filled. We have made a noticeable reduction in memory usage. And our CPU time has gone down by, you know, 300 microseconds. And we can kind of probably see where this is going to go next. Now, remember, there are lots of bad code snippets on this. This code snippet is not good. It looks like it's good. It looks like it, you know, uh, 
and it works, but it does have a problem and we're gonna use this uh, to talk about later. But we've made things use even less memory. We've actually removed one of the allocations. So on our previous slide, we've got two allocations. We've got the car array and we've got the string. So it's no surprise that if we remove one of the allocations, the allocated count goes down by half because stack alloc does not count as an allocation. We fill our buffer with random characters. And then when we're done, because we have a new string overload that now takes a span, we can return this um, into a string. So the only thing we've done here is we've allocated the string and just the string. That buffer that's on the stack, that is not an allocation on the heap. On the heap, that's an allocation on the stack. The new string basically takes the buffer and copies it into the string. So that's why we're able to uh, uh, turn it into a string. So that uh, that's where that allocation has come from. It's literally saying, you know, give me uh, what's in the span. I'm going to copy it into into the string as an internal representation, and now the only allocation we have is this 48 byte string. And if your API wants to, you could actually make this zero. The difference is instead of returning a string, we just say, give me a span of stuff and I'm just gonna fill it with random things. Uh, this doesn't allocate anything because, well, there's no new string, there's no new car array. So maybe whatever's calling get random string can say, you know, stack alloc, you know, uh, car 32, call get random string. It will fill that with a bunch of random characters. And at no point have we allocated anything. So we've got our allocations down to zero. So this means this particular example right here uh, creates zero work for the garbage collector. So it's kind of an interesting note here that, you know, we uh, didn't say return a span, it's a void, meaning it returns nothing. And we say, give me a span and I'm gonna fill with stuff. And this goes back to uh, stack data is freed when you uh, return from your method. So we can't return a span. Um, not a span that's pointing at stack data. And we're going to talk more about span in a few minutes. Um, but as we discussed earlier, we can take in data that might be allocated on the stack and fill it with something. This is a very prevalent pattern in .NET. So again, using a, a security API, um, you know, if we want to hash something in .NET, you can uh, use one of the new APIs that says, you know, SHA-256 hash data, give me some data to the source, and I'm going to write the hash to this destination. This does not allocate. Um, it returns an int just to say how much data it wrote to the destination. Um, in this case, since it's SHA-256, it'll always write 32 bytes to destination. Um, uh, and it doesn't really care what this destination is. As long as it can write to it, it's going to fill it with the hash. And it might be on the stack. So let's talk more about span because I've, you know, we've looked at it uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, a span is a ref struct. This is a relatively new construct in uh, .NET. It appeared in C sharp seven, seven point one, seven point two. Somebody knows, just shout it out. Um, somewhere in the seven timeline. I don't think it was seven point oh. Um, it is a ref struct, and it's normally it's just a normal struct. Uh, the only difference is it's got this little ref modifier on here. Um, and uh, one of the things that this tries to accomplish is, is it limits, you know, really where this span uh, can be used. Um, they cannot, a ref struct cannot be a field on a class for a member, and it can't be a field on a struct either, because uh, structs might be boxed. Um, the only place you can really have a span is as a local variable. Uh, oh, shoot, Jared's watching. Oh, crud, I wonder how many wrong things I've said. Um, good to know. Um, but uh, uh, they are particularly limited. Um, they can only uh, live as locals. 
and uh, they can be as fields on other rough structs. Um, and they, again, they might point to stack data. And the C sharp compiler does a limited form of escape analysis that we are going to uh, take a, a quick look at next. Um, and this is really where I think C sharp makes uh, the uh, uh, span, you know, quite a bit useful. Uh, so we said that, you know, we couldn't return a span. Well, what happens if we try? Well, it really won't let you do that um, unless it knows that it can. Uh, this, you know, will not compile because it says it knows that thing is on the stack. It won't let us return it out. It knows, it doesn't know that where this points to, so it doesn't let this compile. So this is, you know, really why the span is particularly useful because it takes things uh, um, as a concern and it tries to eliminate as many of these things as possible. And the C sharp compiler does a very good job of that um, to make sure that you're not doing something which will frankly destabilize your program, which is taking stack data and trying to use it after it's no longer available. But it does allow it when it can. Um, for example, we have a span that is taken as input and we return a slice of the span. That's okay, because either we don't know where this span is, but uh, we know that it didn't originate on the stack inside of trim first car, so it allows it to be returned. If it knows that the span is pointing to something that is okay, like uh, an array, that's okay too. Um, and spans are not just for stack data. They can be for stacked alloc data. They can point to arrays, as we saw in the previous slide. You can allocate them to point at normal memory. They can point to uh, uh, text data inside of your binary. That's one of the C sharp compiler optimizations that it will do with read only span. They can point to the interior of other spans. They can really kind of point to anything. The only other caveat to it, though, is, is it will err on the side of safety if it doesn't know. Um, a span's uh, availability is determined at the moment that that span is kind of introduced. Um, so if the compiler isn't sure, it's going to assume that uh, it should be allowed to escape. So for example, we have a method here called do a thing. And so far, all I've done here is I've said thing. I've declared a span and I'm saying if twice stack alloc 16 else thing equals stack alloc byte eight else return zero. But that still doesn't compile, but we're not actually returning a span. We're not doing anything, you know, uh, here that's bad. But what the C sharp compiler doesn't know is whether or not it should allow thing to escape. So encounters span thing, it does not uh, know at that moment whether or not it should allow it to escape. So the compiler looks at this and says, like, I need to treat this safely uh, because it might be returned later. Um, so when it tries to assign thing to stack alloc byte equals 16, the compiler doesn't let that happen because it says, wait a second, that thing that I saw up there earlier, I think that can escape later. So it doesn't allow us to assign thing to stack alloc data. The way that you work around that right now is you can just say stack alloc thing byte equals zero. That actually doesn't do a stack alloc, but it does hint to the compiler that, you know, this thing is not going to escape my method. Okay. So let's just talk about some of these sharp edges that uh, I promised I would talk a little bit about. So let's go back to this example of code that is wrong. And again, thinking about Stack Overflow, you know, the website, what do we think is going to happen when we say, give me a random string that's 2 billion characters long? We're going to Stack Overflow. That might seem obvious here, but Let's talk about what exactly a stack overflow means to your process. It means your process is going down. You cannot recover from a stack overflow. 
Um, at the worst case, this can be something that resembles a denial of service. Think about this in the context of an ASP.NET application. Let's think that this is an API on, uh, that you are, are serving on ASP.NET. You have an API that calls get random string. And uh, one of the uh, query parameters says like, you know, give me a length of a string um, to generate. I'll generate a random string and I'll return it back. Doesn't sound like a particularly useful API, but let's, you know, for sake of argument, say, say that that's there. Okay. Well, if somebody says, okay, generate a random string for me that is 2 billion characters long, your ASP.NET process has crashed. And that is going to affect everybody else that is using your ASP.NET process. They might be in the middle of uploading a file or downloading a file or you know, something like that. It has just taken down your whole ASP.NET process. Um, so, and again, if an attacker were to figure this out, they could, of course, just slam that request on your server and just keep taking it down every time you bring it back up. You know, it'd be great if just the person requesting, you know, this got an error saying like, that's too big, but that's not what actually happens. It, you run out of stack space. You might see a stack overflow exception, but it's not really an exception that is in the traditional sense that it can be caught. Okay, so we know it's fatal to the process. You cannot recover from stack overflows um, other than just start the process back up again. And where stack overflow gets, or where stack alloc gets particularly dangerous is where you have a mix of stack alloc and any kind of user input influencing what stack alloc does. Okay, so uh, what do we say, what do we mean when we mean by input? Um, you know, input uh, is really anything that happens outside of the influence of your code. It might mean, you know, a query parameter on an, on an API. It might be the number of processes that is running on your machine. Uh, it's, you know, might be an IP address of, you know, uh, that, you know, somebody is hitting your service with. It's really anything that you don't control. Um, and what we need to think about with stack alloc is how can an abuser uh, get your stack alloc to do something that you didn't think it should do? And it's actually surprisingly tricky. It almost kind of turns into a code puzzle. And I don't really like code puzzles. Um, but uh, so let's put spans to work because remember, spans can point to heap data too. And again, like I said from the beginning, this code is still wrong. Um, so we have. So let's think about how we can make this uh, a little bit smarter. We say, okay, let's say we really do need to support, you know, uh, getting a random string that's 20 megabytes in size for sake of argument. If our stack, if the length that we want is bigger than 64, well then let's just use an array because we know arrays can be pretty big because they're on the heap. If it's less than or equal to 64, then let's use the stack. So we'll make our buffer, we'll fill it, and then we'll return our new string. So as an interlude, before we dig into that one a little bit more, how much really can I put on the stack? And that's really going to be a uh, um, uh, limitation of what your operating system and what kind of hardware you're running on. Um, desktop Linux, for example, will typically mean you have a total stack size of eight megabytes. Mac OS gives you eight megabytes too, except when it decides not to. If it's a, if it's a background thread, you get 512. Uh, Windows is one, and I have a note on there about IIS being low, and I think that's probably changed over the past couple of years. Um, I think, you know, with particularly with Kestrel, since Kestrel is just a normal process, it gets a normal stack size as well. Um, but the point is to illustrate that the stack is really not all that much. It's, you know, uh, something that is a resource that needs to be fairly conservatively used. So 
that kind of goes to say you should not use as, as much stack space as you possibly can. Because remember, if you're calling into a method that is using stack space, let's go back to our previous code here, you know, where we say random number generator get int 32. That is using stack space too. So if I were to use as much stack space as, poss as I possibly could in buffer, well, there's a chance that random number generator get in 32 is not going to have enough spec stack space for itself either. And at the end of the day, it's not something you particularly control, even though every OS has defaults and things like that. Um, you know, when you're running an, a uh, cross-platform, you know, something like .NET, it might not be as large as you think it was. Linux is particularly... Uh, able to be tuned to this as much as you want. A particular Linux distribution might have a stack space that is smaller uh, because it's meant to run on a Raspberry Pi or something similar. Okay, so um, to actually use some real numbers here, uh, my recommendation for using is how much stack space should be fairly low. The .NET team uh, runtime team makes a particular target of one kilobyte for a stack allocation. And that's a kilobyte, not 1,024 things into the stack alloc. That's 1,024 bytes total. You know, thinking like car here, for example, car is each car occupies two bytes. So when we say stack alloc car 64, that's really using 128 bytes. When we say stack alloc in 64, that's actually using 256 bytes. Okay, and a point to drive home here is, is I have particularly always said that your stack allocation is freed when your method returns. It does not um, return when it goes out of scope. So let's say using our fancy new string generation API, somebody with a big government contract comes to us and says like, I really need to generate just so many strings. Uh, and you think, okay, I'm gonna make an API that batch generates strings, very cool. So it takes, a length of strings, but also how many strings you want to generate. So here we're returning a string array. And really we're just doing the same code now, but in a loop. Um, but we have made a crucial mistake of putting a stack alloc in a loop. Even though this buffer is not accessible outside of the loop, we are actually allocating count times length times the size of the character here each time. So you know, we have this, you know, bigger growth of the stack use than we want. The right way to do this is to have your stack alloc outside of your loop and use it as a scratch buffer. Because remember, we said earlier that when you say new string, it gets copied in there. So we can fill the buffer, make a new string, fill the buffer, make a new string until we're done. That's okay. The good news is, I believe Roslyn has an analyzer that will uh, tell you, please do not use stack alloc inside of a loop. Um, and an analyzer is basically a compiler warning. The compiler warning will say like, you've got a stack alloc in a loop, you really shouldn't do that. Um, but let's keep looking at uh, stack alloc and uh, how can we keep making this thing safer? Okay, so if the length is greater than 64, we're going to throw an argument out of range. Let's just say sake of argument, we there is no reason why we should be able to generate a uh, random string bigger than 64 characters. We just have no business need for it. Um, so we know length is less than or equal to 64. We stack alloc it. We're not doing it in a loop. Are we okay? What could go wrong? Okay, so here's probably one of my biggest peeves on Stack Overflow, or sorry, on Stack Alloc, is what happens when I say Stack Alloc byte negative one? This won't actually compile because it's a constant, but if you said Stack Alloc byte with a variable and the variable happens to be negative one, it's going to do something like that last bullet. It is literally going to try to stack alloc something like four gigabytes. Remember, we said we had at most eight um, 
megabytes available to us and we want to use a kilobyte, four gigabyte sounds a little bit bigger. Okay, so that knowledge in hand, what mistake have we made? Oh, okay, so we, we need to make sure that length is uh, less than 64, but we also need to make sure it's greater than zero. Technically zero is okay, but doesn't make sense to generate a random string of zero, so we'll throw an error for that. Okay, so we know it's uh, somewhere between one and 64 inclusive. Okay, so now we're okay. So wait a second. Why does using negative one uh, alloc try to stack alloc four gigabytes? Well, stack alloc, even though if you look at the documentation for it, it says, give me an integer. It treats it as unsigned. So basically what it's doing is, is it's taking its input, if it's an int, and it's treating it like it's a uint. And because of how numbers work in two's complements, um, negative one works out to something like four gigabytes when you remove the sign bit. So that's kind of unfortunate. All right. All right, so let's think, okay, we got, we got our next big government contract for our random string generation API. What do we need to do? We have a new API, doesn't even generate an array of strings. It says, okay, I love this random string generation API that you got here, Kevin. What I really need to do now is generate random strings, but I want an API that lets me put a prefix in front of it. So let's say I want, you know, uh, every random string that I generate to start with the word hello. So prefix will be H-E-L-L-O, -L -L -O, and then we say, you know, give me a length. Okay. All right, so let's look at this. We've got a length. If the length is less than or equal to zero, we don't allow it. Okay. If the prefix length plus the length is greater than 64, we don't allow it. So we're still saying the total string has to be less than or equal to 64 characters. Okay, cool. So we take our prefix plus our length, it's greater than 64, throw. And now we're gonna stack alloc that, but according to our validation here, stack alloc prefix plus prefix length plus length is less than or equal to 64. So it should be safe, right? Okay, cool. We take our prefix, we copy it to our buffer, and then we fill the rest up with our, you know, uh, random characters, and then we return a string. Are we good? All right. So, what are we gonna, what are we going to do if we say, uh, I want to prefix my string with v1, and I want to generate a random string that is 2.1 billion characters long. Okay, let's think about this. V1 is two characters. And we say two plus two billion one hundred and forty seven million four hundred and eighty three thousand six hundred and forty six is you know, it really should just be blah 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 six hundred and forty eight, right? Unfortunately, we're going to stack overflow. Why is that? Okay, so remember we're dealing with integers here, which have a, and we're dealing with signed integers. So the maximum uh, value that a signed integer can be is uh, uh, two to the 31st power minus one. So we've overflowed our arithmetic. So two plus the two billion number that I'm not going to say again is actually negative 2.1 billion. So let's take negative 2.1 billion and look through all of our checks. Well, negative 2.1 billion is less than zero. Um, oh, sorry. 
if we if so our length is actually uh uh 2.1 billion and it that means it is greater than zero right okay but when we add here it's actually less than 64 because it's we've done the we've done the addition here and now now it's less than 64 so we end up putting a giant negative number into stack alloc which gets again gets treated as unsigned and allocates a huge number okay and this is because by default in c sharp and uh, i'm sorry jared if you're still listening it is a giant peeve of mine that c sharp's default behavior is to do unchecked arithmetic um but how can we work around this well we can do uh one of two things we can use the checked keyword here just ba checked basically means if the arithmetic overflows uh or then throw it'll throw an arithmetic overflow exception or an arithmetic exception or an overflow exception one of the two three um and that's okay it means you're still getting an exception but instead of crashing your process now you know, the person calling your API maliciously is now just going to get an HTTP 500. That's fine. And, you know, that doesn't take down your program. You can just look at the logs and go like, oh, okay, you know, you shouldn't do that. Um, and if we know that the arithmetic uh, doesn't overflow, then it's fine. Uh, the other recommendation I would make is to just turn on checked arithmetic by default if you have a greenfield.net application. Um, this basically means all arithmetic is going to be checked. Uh, if it overflows or underflows, it, you're going to get a runtime exception. Uh, personally speaking, I see absolutely no reason not to enable checked uh, for overflow underflow by, by default. Uh, if you have a large complex code base uh, that already exists, uh, using it Changing that can actually be very difficult. Um, but if you're starting from scratch, I would strongly consider it. Uh, some people may, you know, get on their per, may start talking about performance and say, you know, oh, but that overflow check stuff, you know, that hurts, you know, performance. And I got to tell you that that is a micro optimization on top of a micro optimization. I, if arithmetic overflowing, uh, is showing up on you know your CPU profiles, then I can't imagine it's happening everywhere. You can turn on unchecked for specific scopes by using an unchecked block. So if you really do identify somehow that checked arithmetic is hurting performance in a particular method, you can turn it off. But as a default for a program, I think it's a pretty sensible thing to do. Okay, so I can't actually click these links. So everything I've talked about is, is do these bugs actually happen? So the answer to this is yes. Um, uh, the uh, first one, and I, I'm using you know links to everything that's actually happened in .NET itself. The first one is an example where it would uh, stack alloc a uh, struct based on the number of open T TCP sockets on your system, which is technically input. If you, there is something that you can do to drive up the number of established TCP sockets on the system on Mac OS, it would stack overflow. The second one is, uh, uh, and the third ones are ones that uh, I found just by doing some quick little uh, uh, code QL searches where, uh, you know, one was doing, I think the uh, second one was pretty much exactly the, was exactly this case uh, where we had a, uh, where we were doing an addition inside of a stack alloc. We validated that all the integers beforehand made sense, but then we did that final thing of doing the uh, addition uh, in the stack in the stack alloc and ended up overflowing. Okay, so uh, what kind of things can we do to uh, avoid these kind of mistakes? So the first one, pretty obvious: don't stack alloc in a loop. And we have uh, Rosalind is there to help us with that one, the C sharp compiler. Um, my general advice, and I can't easily write code uh, right now, but if I could, I would say you always want to stack alloc a fixed amount. Uh, never put a variable 
inside of your stack alloc. So going back to my previous slide where I said stack alloc car um, of prefix length plus length, I would just say stack alloc car 64. And if the length happened to be less than 64, then I would slice the span to make it something more to be the, the, the actual, actual size. The nice thing about putting a constant inside of your stack alloc is it is incredibly easy to audit from a code perspective. You just look at it and go like, I know exactly how much is going inside of the stack alloc. I know it is 64. It cannot be anything other than 64. It is 64. Um, Uh, and the other thing I would say is don't worry too much about wasting a stack alloc. You always kind of need a stack alloc for, and think about worst cases anyways. So you might think, you know, okay, well, we want a buffer of, you know, let's say, you know, going back to our example here, the most random strings are always going to be just eight characters long, but we need to support up to 64. Like, the, am I wasting, you know, the other uh, 56 characters? Well, no. Remember, stack alloc is, you know, quote unquote free. So it's easier to just st stack alloc for the whole thing. And there is a slight performance benefit when you do a stack alloc with a constant number anyways. So uh, let's look at a couple of other examples here. So I'm saying I want to stack alloc just straight up 256 bytes. I can look at this, I can have code analyzers and static analysis or whatever, can look at this and have absolutely zero data in its mind. I am stack allocating 256 bytes. There is no potential for arithmetic overflows or you know, a negative sneaking in there somewhere or anything like that. It's just 256, very easy to audit. I am going to say, uh, I want to print my UTF, my string, uh, as hex. So I want to take the string, I want to convert it to bytes, and I want to show it in hex. Just for a sake of argument here, we say if our max is greater than our buffer's length, then, oh, let's just make an array anyways. And we're not going to worry too much about doing that, doing that stack alloc anyways. So did we waste a stack alloc? Maybe, but, you know, it's... Uh, very easy and straightforward to do and to look at it this way. And remember, and again, that stack alloc is not costing us much. So if our buffer isn't big enough, then we say, okay, we're going to switch to arrays now. We're going to use the APIs correctly and we're going to convert it to a string. Um, and uh, since buffer is a span, this slice syntax on a span uh, slicing a span doesn't copy anything. So it's, you know, uh, it just gives you a new span that just points to the inside of the previous span. So it's uh, a very uh, easy thing to uh, work with. This I consider kind of iffy, um, but is another pattern that I've seen. Uh, mainly because I can't look at this and think this is very obvious to me. I see stack alloc, I see byte, I see max, which is a variable. Is this okay? Kind of, but it has a couple of hidden, you know, things that you got to look for. For example, we're taking max and we are converting it to a uint before we check its length. Thus, we are making sure that it is not negative. So we are actually doing the check if uh, max ends up being negative, which for UTF get max byte count being negative doesn't make any sense. But uh, if it's bigger than our max stack size, then we use an array. Otherwise, we use a stack alloc. This works, but you know, from how easy can I validate that this is right when I'm if if you're doing a code review of using stack alloc, it's not immediately clear to me. Okay, and I want to mention one other rough edge on stack alloc, which is that when you say I want a new array of byte, of car, of, you know, int, whatever, it's always going to be initialized to defaults. It's going to be initialized to zeros um, in the case of like byte or array or something like that. That is not true with stack alloc. 
stack alloc data uh, by by default, I would say you should assume that the stack alloc is just filled with garbage. It might contain numbers. It might you know of you know zero, forty two, uh, ninety six, whatever. Um, it does not uh, guarantee that it's going to be zero. Now, the thing that's really tricky about this is it might look like it's going to be zero. But again, depending on whether you're doing a debug or a release build or whether or not you are using something called skip locals init, where you can actually tell the C-sharp compiler, I really don't want you to ever initialize things to default. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, don't depend on data that is filled that you created with stack alloc containing anything sensible. You can't assume that it's, you know, initialized to zeros uh, or anything like that. If you need it to contain something, then you have to write to it. So if you want your stack alloc to be guaranteed filled with zeros, then call clear on the span or, you know, write zeros, you know, where you need to. Um, but don't assume that it contains anything, you know, sensible. Um, from a security perspective, one of the things that can actually happen is your stack alloc might be filled with, you know, other data, uh, other user data um, that happened from, you know, somewhere else. You really don't know what that is. Um, so clear it out if you're uh, using uh, stack. Okay. And then my final point would be, do you even need to do stack alloc at all? Um, it is a very powerful micro optimization. It uh, reduces your allocated memory. It reduces the work uh, uh, by your garbage collector. It's particularly useful for library authors and you know the .NET team, for example, because uh, as an example, um, you know the purpose of a high quality library is to be efficient so that you know developers don't have to write the most efficient code in the first place. Um, if a library is inefficient, then you know consumers of that library can't really do anything about it. On the other hand, using stack alloc doesn't reduce the number of calls to your database, um, you know, which will take orders of magnitude more. I mean, when we were looking at our benchmarks previously, everything was being done on the scale of, you know, microseconds. Uh, but to, you know, be uh, clear though, that kind of stuff does add up. Um, particularly if you're doing something that puts a lot of pressure on the garbage collector. Okay, so I am done. Now would be a good time if we have any questions in chat or if anybody wants to tell me anything I did wrong or it wasn't clear about, I would love to talk about that now. And I will say, uh, Kevin, I've been monitoring the chats, and we haven't had we haven't had so many in the way of in the way of questions. Um, and I was looking, I was trying to note questions along the way, and my list is is actually blank as well. I think you covered it uh, pretty thoroughly. I like that you linked to the .NET uh, bugs as well, and maybe we can drop those into the comments in the in the meetup uh, after this. But no, over, overall, I think this is very thorough. And I'm, I'm going to give folks a couple more seconds if they want to you know, put something in the chat or let us know that you've got a question. I know sometimes it's on a little bit of a delay as well. Um, so if folks have a question, feel free to, to answer that in the chat or at least uh, raise your hand and tell us that you're typing something, which may take a moment, uh, and we'll go, for, we'll go from there. Um, uh, Kevin, I would say, given the prevalence of, of stack alloc and spans, I mean, how much of .NET at this point is making use of that? Is it truly widespread throughout the code base? Are there large chunks that are still being refactored towards that? Or, or do you feel like a lot of progress has been made towards using, you know, towards using the, those tools so far? Uh, within the .NET code base itself, it's used pretty yeah. heavily. I, I think I did an audit of the code base. That's actually where I found two of those bugs. Um, it was used 840 something times within the .NET code base. Um, and a lot of the uses of it are quite sensible where it's just literally stack alloc, you know, eight, you know, that's, uh, quite straightforward. Um, but new things are using stack alloc all the time. I added a new one a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, but, uh, I, for all of the, one of the things that I think the, the .NET team has really, uh, hammered out here is, um, uh, anywhere that 
perf is being left on the table and stack alloc will figure it will you know help with some of that they've identified it and got um a lot of the uh or if not all of the low-hanging fruit nice so it's not it's not that there's some massive call out there for for the the dynamic code base for folks to jump in on the specific uh problem or anything along those lines oh we have here uh comments this talk was delicious. Thank you very much. For me, it was absolutely worth staying up all night. Uh, I think it was one of our viewers from from uh, from elsewhere, um, so from other uh, outside of the continental US. So I just want to say thank you uh, for, for that comment. So Kevin, you're already getting great feedback and I haven't heard any additional questions. Um, so I think at that point, we'll we'll go ahead and, uh, and wrap it up. Kevin, are there any parting thoughts or anything that you'd like the .NET DC community to know or or, or the DC uh, programming uh, cohort in general to know before we before we wrap up? No, I just want to thank everyone for your time, especially if you stayed up late. I um, hope this was a uh, value to you. And again, you know, Twitter handles there if something was unclear or um, you have any follow-up stuff, drop me a note on Twitter. That's usually the best way to get a hold of me. Um, and thank you all so much for your time. Great. And, and Kevin, thanks a lot for making the time to come out and talk with us. I know, you know this is a very specific area of expertise that we don't necessarily you know, get to have uh, hands on with someone who's doing it as deeply as you are. So really appreciate you making the time and, and coming out for us. So uh, thanks again. And look, even, see, even Jared, even Jared, I'm going to put that up in the <laughs> video just so you know. Jared said he enjoyed the talk. So so there you go. No no fear from, from his presence tonight. Uh, no, but seriously, thank you very much, Kevin. Appreciate it. And thank you to everyone for coming out. And again, we'd love to have you out out as a speaker or, or to understand a little bit more what you're looking like, uh, what you're looking about for, for topics. So do uh, please go ahead and, and reach out to us um, at github.com slash .NET DC. We have our open governance uh, repository there, and we would love to hear from you as a viewer or a potential speaker. So until then, I hope you and your family stay well, stay safe, and uh, and have a great time uh, with the joy of coding. So, And with that, we'll go ahead and bid you good evening, and thanks a lot. Good night. Thanks again, Kevin. Thanks.